didn't call me to play golf with you tomorrow, yesterday. I didn't know you played golf. No, I was probably preaching over somewhere else. Anyway, yeah, so. that's two people now I'm in trouble with. I'm yeah. also in trouble with Pastor Bainbridge. Yeah. I didn't call Garth. Uh-oh. But Stuart, can you tell us, what is your favourite sport? Golf. Go- yeah, right. <laughs> Passed for that, didn't I? Yeah. Now I really do feel bad. You know, I have, uh, I have two sons that play golf. One plays uh, really, really well, hits the ball 300 yards kind of well. And uh, I, I have a fun time, often on Tuesdays af- afternoons, we play together. But the, the boys and I, our favorite sport really is basketball. We're big Los Angeles Laker fans. So we, uh, our cable system on our TV carries all the home games for the Lakers on one channel, all the away games for the Lakers on another channel, and uh, we generally get together either in front of the TV or on the telephone after a great play together with my boys. So that's a fun thing for us to do. Okay, terrific. I'll remember you when Gavin asks me to... I think we might try and go on Friday again. I'm really missing my family uh, this morning, Stu. And I was reflecting as I was lying in bed this morning um, the time that my wife Debbie and myself first met. Would you like to share with us the time that you and your wife Mm. first met? Do you know, we remember it very well. We were in our second year in high school and I had been at this uh, uh, boarding school the first year of high school. My wife, (laughs) my, my friend Karen came uh, the second year, and on registration day, it happened to be September the 4th, we met. I came down early to be the first one in line in registration, ran around the corner of the administration building, and there she was, already in line, with her mother and her sister. And we had about an hour before the doors opened, and we became friends. Um, Karen's mother used to say that she wondered that day if Karen and I would ever get together. I'm not sure that was true. I was 14 years old, Karen was 15 years old, and uh, that's the day we met. We started dating uh, late in the next year together, and uh, we've been dating ever since. Terrific. Yeah. Terrific. That's good. I firmly believe that God puts special people in our lives so that he can be reflected through them. And my wife has taught me a lot about God. Do you mind sharing with us, Stuart, what has your marriage to Karen, is it, taught you about God? Well, um, as you're saying that about your wife, I was thinking the same about my wife. Karen has been the most important spiritual influence in my life. She has had a, a very close personal relationship with Jesus, I think, all of her life. And I had one of those relationships with Jesus that was at a distance and I did the right things and and it was that kind of, um, you know, I was a good boy and I sang in church and I took theology and I did the right things, but Karen knew what it meant to have a friendship with Jesus. And it was Karen also who taught me about God's grace because you're a very gracious person and and I was uh, much more of a legalist until a long, uh, 12 years ago when I bought a book for Karen called The Grace Awakening. And I thought, oh, that'd be a good book for her to read. She would enjoy that. And she read it and was by our bed and I picked it up and I began to read it. And, and uh, it was through that book that I got interested in, in it too. But um, boy, I wish my wife was here. Stephen and Leanne know her. She's just a lovely lady. I talked to her about uh, an hour and a half ago. Uh, she's, um, she's having a busy week. She said for me to hurry home so things would slow down when I got there. I'm not sure what that means, Matt. but it's, uh <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for sharing uh, with us. Um, is it good to find out a little bit about your speaker? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really encouraging, and I think it's... Um, uh-oh. And I just want you to be prepared. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to ask Matt three questions. Oh. Oh. And I'm not going to tell you what they are ahead of time, but you're going to get it tomorrow. Okay. Okay. And actually, yesterday morning, you said you were going to ask me a question today. Yeah. What was the 
a question about why you didn't ask me to play golf. No, no, no. The, the embarrassing moment? Oh, the embarrassing moment. Tell us that, will you? I, I can't think of any. You can't think. No. Um, you'll, you'll have one tomorrow morning to tell. Yeah. <laughs> Later on, you'll be able to remember tomorrow morning. Right. But um, actually, just talking about my wife, I think I have come up with one, and that was... Um, has anybody ever fainted? Have you fainted? And you've had one of those slow motion faints? You ever had one of those? Um, I can remember the day we were married. Um, <laughs> we were standing in front of the church and we said to the pastor, look, we, we don't want a really long um, sermon, talk, that sort of thing. And uh, he just went on and on and on and on. And um, I was standing there, and you know how everything goes a light green? <laughs> You've never fainted. Bless you. Um, then it went a darker green, you know, and then it went sort of a funny blue colour. And I didn't go down. I didn't go down, but um, I remember Deb turning to me and saying, Are you all right? And the microphone, I think, picked it up. Right in the middle of my wedding. So that was probably one of the most embarrassing moments. But This morning for our prayer time, we're going to do something a little bit different. What we're going to do is ask you to be part of the prayer time. We've all got things to be thankful for. And I don't think the microphones are long enough. But this morning, are there some people here this morning that would like to share with us something that they are thankful for today. Something that's happened today that they can be thankful to God for. Would you share with us? The sun. There's a thank you. The sun. Thank Pardon? For being here. Yeah. Friends to have breakfast with. Some others. Family. family. Oh, now you've started it inside. I'm wanting my family badly today. <laughs> Thank you. Any others? The, the opportunity to worship continuously. I like that. Mm. Some others. For the encouragement that we've had from all the speakers. Thank you. That's encouraging, isn't it, Pastor Tyna? Yeah. All the songs. Yeah. Lovely. A couple more. How about on this side of the tent? For miracles. Thank you. Thank you. How about on the far side of the tent? Is there somebody over there that's thankful for something this morning that you'd like to share with us? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Don't we have a lot to be thankful for? And I think that um, this morning... Um, for just a, about 30 seconds, 30 or 45 seconds, I want you to just close your eyes and talk to God yourself and thank Him for something that's special to you. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that you are such a good God to us. We thank you that the invitation is there in Scripture to taste and see that the Lord is good. It is only, Lord, as we experience you and your grace and your love and your mercy that we can resonate with those words of Scripture. We thank you, Lord, for the weather. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for our friends, our family. We thank you for the opportunity of worshipping. We thank you for the way that you work in our lives in miraculous ways.
And Lord, we thank you that we can be here together. We thank you too, Lord, for Pastor Tyner. We thank you for his ministry. We thank you that he has such a wonderfully supportive family. We thank you that you have given him such a wonderful role in your church. And Lord, this morning as he opens the word of God to us, we ask that you will please bless him, that you will reassure him of your presence, that he will feel your arms of encouragement around him, and that for us that listen to him and interact, that we too will be blessed by you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thinking about all the things that you're thankful for, I just shared with you. Uh, everything that was mentioned, I felt like I could say amen to that. It's been wonderful to be here. I have four presentations today and then just two tomorrow and one Sabbath. So I'm on the downward slope of my assignment here, but it's just been wonderful to be with you. Thank you for all the encouraging words after the meetings, the conversations we've had. Um, and I have enjoyed the, the conversations and the music here, the prayers that Matt's let out in. Um, Paul, thank you for your music. Um, I don't know if you've all gotten acquainted with Paul. This is his very first camp meeting. We're so glad that you're with us. And they're always here in the front row. It's been great. Travis met me today saying there's good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is that it was too hot for the people down here with the big lights on, and so he's put these lights on today. The bad news is that it's about much, much more hot up here than with these lights on. I was going to say 20 degrees, but I don't, that doesn't mean anything, does it? Uh, it's Anyway, it's a lot hotter here. So uh, if things start to turn light green and dark green for me here, <laughs> you'll catch me, won't you? Today is uh, 17th of January. It's my youngest son's birthday today. He's 23 years old. I can't remember the last time I missed a birthday. Uh, but the nice thing is that he doesn't know it's his birthday because it's yesterday for him. I'm not quite sure how that works, but uh, he hasn't missed his birthday yet. By the time I talk to him, it'll be tomorrow. And then I will say, well, I'm, you know, it's not going to work out anyway. So happy birthday, Ben, wherever you are today. God is the hero of the Bible stories, we've been saying. You okay with that? Um, seems like it's been easy as we've uh, seen this. Today I want to talk about a story that is one of the prime examples about how we have made the human in the story the hero. It's the story of David fighting Goliath. You'll find it in 1 Samuel 17. And we have made David the hero of this story as long as I can remember. We do it with children. We sing about David. And uh, we hardly ever talk about God being the hero of this story. But I think there's a lot in this story to teach us to hear God's voice speaking to us as we've been saying this week. And to try to find out about salvation, there's so much in this story. So let's jump right in. But to get to 1 Samuel 17, oh, I wanted to tell you, several people asked me yesterday after our morning meeting where I ever heard that story of uh, Hezekiah and the Nehushtan. Well, it's in 2 Kings uh, chapter 18. I guess I didn't give that reference yesterday. 2 Kings 18, if you want to look it up later on about how the Israelites began to worship the uh, serpent on the pole, the bronze serpent. Second uh, Kings 18. It's a fascinating story. It's the only place in the Bible that it tells about the Nehushtan. So you want to look that up. In order to get to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and the lessons about the families, we have to begin in 1 Chronicles chapter 2. So if you want to turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 2, these are the genealogies that begin 1 uh, Chronicles, and they're just fascinating if you have the time. They're usually the stories that we pass by, and we don't know what they were even included by, but today and tomorrow I want to share with you some, some stories that come out of the chronologies, and this is an interesting one. In chapter 2, of uh, First Chronicles, we have the, the genealogy of David. 
You see chapter 2, verse 13. Jesse was the father of, and then the, the sons are named. And notice in verse 16, the one place in the Bible where we're told who David's sisters were. Their names were Zeruiah and Abigail. It's good to know there were girls in the family. Sometimes the Bible stories just don't seem to make any mention of the women in the story. We've passed by a couple this week where the women are very important. Abraham and Sarah, Jacob and uh, Leah and Rachel. And uh, today the, the girls play uh, a little part in it. But tomorrow I want to tell you the story of a wise woman whose name we don't know, but she is a fascinating character in the David cycle. It's just a, an amazing story and we usually pass right by it. But today, uh, just nice to know that there were a couple of girls in the family. And you can imagine what the family was like when they sat around in the evening. By the time we get to 1 Samuel 17, Jesse is an older man. We don't know the name of David's mother, Jesse's wife. Perhaps she's passed away by this time, by the time we get to 1 Samuel 17, nor is she mentioned here. But you can imagine all these children, probably uh, nine or ten of them, depending on which, uh, which story you read of the family, they would get together in the warm evenings, uh, no television to go in and watch, no Laker games to look at. So they would sit out uh, in the beautiful evenings around Bethlehem. The, uh, the hills of Bethlehem are steep, and you, oh, you are a good man in spite of what Travis has been saying about you. Thank you very much. Don't go too far away, Matt. I'm going to drink that one in a few minutes. Matt, you're turning light green. What's going on? Oh, no, it's the lights are changing. That's okay. Um, the, the hills around Bethlehem are, are very steep, and you can imagine this family, large family, sitting out in front of their tent in the evening, looking at the beautiful stars, maybe having a little fire in the fire pit, and the children saying to their father, Jesse, will you tell us the stories about grandma and grandpa, and great grandma and grandpa, and great, great grandmother, and all of the things that they love to tell about. Do we have any, any grandparents here in the tent today? Let me see your hand. My hand's raised too. I have four beautiful grandchildren, two boys and two girls. Do we have any great-grandparents in the tent? Oh, my, a number of them. Good for you. God bless you. Do we have any great-great-grandparents in the tent? That's asking a little too much, isn't it? Well, David would ask his uh, father, Jesse, to talk about the great-great-grandparents and the great... You know that Jesse's grandparents... David's great-great-grandparents were Ruth and Boaz. Isn't that amazing? And so they could just talk about what great-grandma and great-grandpa did. David and the other kids would do it. And then Jesse could talk about his great-grandmother, who was Rahab. We go right back to the story that we talked about yesterday as the children of Israel crossed into the promised land for the first time. Remember the spies went into Jericho and they met Rahab. She's Jesse's great-grandmother, David's great-great-grandmother. Isn't that amazing? Just a few generations passed and the kids around the family circle would just meet there together and talk about their ancestors. Let me pause in the story just long enough to tell you how important family worship is. I grew up in the Adventist church when family worship was something that we did all the time. Uh, it, was, it was almost part of the definition of being a Seventh-day Adventist. It was an amazing time when we had family worship in the morning and the evening and the church produced for the first time the resources to support family worship. But I have to tell you the day that the research indicates that only about 15% of our Adventist children have family worship as frequently as one time a week these days. And with lots of moms and dads working, it's just kind of family worship has gone the way of the dinosaurs, and we don't do it anymore. And it remains the most effective 
family spiritual factor. If you want your children to get a great head start spiritually, or your grandchildren to get that kind of head start, be sure that they're getting family worship. There's so many good things that we could be saying this morning about family worship. Uh, it is important that family worship is meaningful to the children. And not that we just pick up a book and read something that was written by adults for adults. Family worship is really a time for the youngest ones in the family. And meaning is more important than frequency. If you had to choose between frequency and meaning, choose meaning and make sure that that one time that you have family worship a week is really meaningful to your children, that they take part, they enjoy what's happening, and it makes sense to them, and it speaks to the issues in their lives. Of course, the best thing to do is have meaningful family worship with frequency. Then you're getting the best of everything. Uh, it's a time for enjoyment and involvement aimed at the youngest in the family. It's not a time for discipline. If your children are acting up, discipline them later. Don't make it a part of family worship. Make it so much fun that your kids enjoy or your grandchildren enjoy family worship. When your grandchildren come to visit you, that's a great thing to do to make sure in the evening that they have family worship. Not a time for conflict. Um, and you can do that partially by the time that you schedule family worship. You know there's no secret time for family worship that you have to have it at that particular time. You have to find in your family a good time to have family worship. Some families do it first thing in the morning. Some, thing, some families do it when the kids come home from school in the afternoon. Sometimes when the mom and dad are finally together in the evening or, or the parent comes home and that's a good time before the evening activities happen. Sometimes uh, it's good just before you go to bed at night to do family worship. Whatever is best for your family is the best time for family worship. But don't make it a time when your schedule of family worship conflicts with other things. Uh, one young woman told me that her dad had family worship every single night that uh, they were together in their home. But his idea of family worship was to do it at the dinner hour after the food had been placed on the plates and set before the family on the table. So mom would bring this hot meal on the plates, put it in the, on the table in front of the kids, and dad would stand up with his Bible or his book and say, before you eat a bite, you must wait for worship. And he would then preach for 15 or 20 minutes. And this girl told me how it was feeling to her to sit there with this wonderful food uh, smelling in front of her and her mouth was watering. She said, when you say family worship, it means torture to me. I, I, wanted to, I want to eat every time I hear the word family worship. <laughs> well, well, how silly of that dad to do that. I hope you're not here today. <laughs> no, it was in a, another part of the world that she told me that. Now, don't intentionally conflict with things for your kids. It's not supposed to be a time of conflict. And while we're talking about that, that father, um, the principle of duration for family worship is that you can do what you need to do in family worship, have a wonderful time together in about 10 minutes. I, I've talked to fathers who believe that they have to preach as long as the preacher preaches in order for family worship to be effective. Just not so. Have a good time together, sing a song, play a game, read a story, do something fun together. In 10 minutes, have a word of prayer. And, and what you're trying to do is establish a pattern that's enjoyable and fun and something you look forward to. One of the things we did in our house on Tuesday nights, we read a continuing story. And we did that improvisational theater technique called hanging on the edge of a cliff. You know how that goes? You take the story and you come to the most exciting part of the story. You know the missionaries are walking home to their compound and they come around the corner and they stop dead in their tracks because in front of them there are two lions sitting there over the zebra that they've killed for supper. And as they hear the missionaries come around the corner, they stop chomping on the zebra and they look up and now the missionaries are the ones that look good for supper. And the lions gather themselves and stand on their forepaws and look directly into the eyes of the missionaries 
and we'll read the rest of that story next Tuesday night. <laughs> and you know, my kids howled, no, let's keep worship going. That's the dynamic you're working for. By, by Sunday night the next week, please, can we have family worship tonight early and read that story? No, we have to wait till Tuesday. Monday night comes, please, Dad, let the... Isn't that the wonderful when the kids are begging you for family worship? That's what you're trying to do. That's the whole idea of making family worship so enjoyable that the kids love to have it. Go to the ABC this afternoon and... Uh, Ask for all the best resources for family worship. There's great books, great storybooks, great games to play together, all the things that you really need to do. Well, imagine David and his brothers and sisters and their father, Jesse, in front of the tent at Bethlehem, sitting around the fire pit, talking about Rahab and the conquest of Jericho and Ruth and, and Boaz and Naomi and oh, what great stories they had to tell. And David grew up in that kind of an atmosphere and he learned the lessons that children are supposed to learn about God being the hero of Bible stories and about God providing for us the, those things that we cannot provide for ourselves. And so David will say when he gets to the battlefield later on in chapter 17 uh, when he when he is, oh, I'm in 2 Samuel. No wonder I can't find it. 1 Samuel 17, when David gets to the battlefield and he goes out and he volunteers to fight Goliath, you remember what he says, uh, verse 34, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep and when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it and I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth and when it turned on me, I seized it by the hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. And if it stopped there, we would have thought, like so many of us, David did not learn the lesson that God was the hero. But look at the next verse, chapter 17, verse 37. David says, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. So David learned growing up in the family worship times exactly who the hero of the stories of, of uh, Ruth and Boaz and Naomi and Rahab and Jesse himself, who the hero of all those stories were. And as he conquered on a daily basis, he was able to give the glory to God. And it's an amazing thing when our children learn that kind of thing. Uh, let me just tell you, parents and grandparents, when you talk to your children and your grandchildren about faith, make sure that they know who the heroes of the stories are. Don't make yourself the hero. Always make God the hero. And there are three levels of, of inspiration that we have when we talk to our children about, about our, their faith and our faith. And the people who study this talk about faith talk and each of these three levels is deeper and more important to children. The, the topmost level of faith talk between adults and children is when children listen to adults talking to each other about their faith. They hear their teachers talking about it. They hear their, their parents talking to other adults about their faith. And they hear things about uh, when they were children and they were growing up in the church and what the church meant to them and they discuss the issues that the pastor has raised in sermons. They talk about what's important to their faith and the theological questions that they have. And children listen on the outskirts of that and it's inspiring for children to hear adults talking about faith to other adults. But a deeper level of faith talk is when adults talk to the children about faith. And children are now catching the stories directly. And so we sit down with our children and our grandchildren and the kids that we teach in Sabbath school, and we talk to them about what faith is going to be like. And when pastors include the world of children in the illustrations for the sermons, children began to catch what faith is all about. And it's much more inspiring to them to, than just hearing us talk to each other when we talk to the children about it. It's better. But the deepest level of faith talk 
is when we sit down with our children and our grandchildren and the kids we're teaching and we talk to them about our faith and we let them talk to us about their faith. When the dialogue is going back and forth and they are saying things like, I'm about to get baptized and I'm really nervous about it. And we say, let me tell you about the day I was baptized, how nervous I was when I was baptized. And we talk about the things that are important to them and we hear their questions and they are open to ask questions to us. And we even say things like, you know, I used to have a question about that too. I remember when I prayed a prayer and God didn't seem to answer my prayer and I know you're feeling like God's left you out of the whole universe because he isn't answering your prayer. I remember feeling that way. Let me tell you how I worked through it. Some of us adults feel like we must always be on top of our feelings and we must never let our children know that we've ever had any questions about the religious life and they are full of questions. And it's so much more inspiring for them when they hear that we've asked questions and we've found some answers too. So the deepest level of faith talk is when we talk but we also listen. And I think David exhibits the spiritual characteristics that that's the kind of home he grew up in. He's already learned who it is that's the hero of the Bible stories. One day, Jesse says to the kids that are still at home, I'm a little bit worried about your three oldest brothers. They've been off in Saul's army for some time now, and uh, I just am wondering about them. I just uh, hope that things are going good. I hear there's a big battle going on between the Philistines, and uh, frankly, I'm a little wonder. I'm, I'm wondering a little bit, a little worried. And I, I thought in the night what we would do is let's prepare a, a meal and we'll wrap it up, and David, we'll get another shepherd to take care of the sheep today, and you take this meal and walk over to to where the the battle is from here and give the meal to your three older brothers. And I think probably all the kids got the ingredients together and they got in the kitchen and put the meal together and they wrapped it up, and David went out to get another shepherd. He got the shepherd to watch the sheep, and he left early the next morning with the meal to take two to his brothers. Um, it's, a, it's always a good idea when the family's involved together, isn't it? And one of the best things that family members can do to other family members is to encourage them. The art of encouragement is one of those arts that seems to be losing uh, its way among families today. How much more important it is, instead of criticizing each behavior, to encourage each other. Ellen White has a a fascinating concept when she's talking about correcting the wrong things that children do. She says when she says to parents when you see objectionable traits arising correct the wrong by strengthening traits of the opposite nature. Isn't that a great idea? When you see something happening with the kids, the grandchildren or your children, and, and you know that they're going in a direction you don't want them to go, the way that you correct the wrong is not by fastening on the wrong and saying, don't do this this way. I've seen parents interrupt a normal, decent, pleasant conversation by suddenly grabbing onto something is a little bit in the periphery, but the parents feel like something has to be taken care of right this minute. And if they don't correct it right now, the kids are gonna grow up to be criminals or something. But the suggestion here is you correct the wrong by strengthening traits of the opposite nature. So you see someone uh, not telling the truth around the table one day, exaggerating a little bit, Put it in your mind to begin to watch for it. And the next time you see that child being absolutely honest about the tiniest little thing, stop the world and get down on the eye level with the child and say, you are such an honest child. Thank you for doing that. Oh, that was amazing. I appreciate it. And then go your way. You don't need to say another thing. Something good's going to happen. 
It's a wonderful thing to be an encouragement to children. And there are so many ways to do it. Often it happens around food, doesn't it? Just like Jesse was knowing he'd like to send some food to the three oldest brothers. But another great way to encourage children especially is to write little notes of encouragement. I've had fun through the years telling people to write notes of encouragement to other people in their family, especially to the children. When you send a lunch in the lunch pail with your children, it just slip a little note in there. When they open the lunch, there's a note from mom or dad. Uh, sometime um, uh, it's nice to write a little letter Take it to the post office and post it and let the kids open the mailbox and find a letter from you to them as a fun thing to do. It Just three ro rules about writing a note of encouragement. I promise I'll get back to this study, but there's so many great things about family life in the early part of this. Three rules about writing notes of encouragement. First of all, keep it short. You don't need to write pages and pages and pages. After a while, it'll get to be... Uh, what's mom really trying to get to at this kind of thing? Just write a couple of sentences. Just keep it short. I really appreciate the way that you helped me in the kitchen this morning. You're such a wonderful help. Thank you, love mom. Um, something like, um, uh, you went to bed last night without complaining one time. It made the evening so pleasant. Thank you. Just keep it short. And then the second rule, be specific. Don't say something like, my, what a good kid you are. <laughs> be specific and tie the encouragement to something good that you've caught the child doing. And then the third rule is to never connect encouragement with past misbehavior. I it was encouraging a group of pastors and their spouses one time to write notes of encouragement to people in their church, in their congregation. And we practiced. It was a small group, about 35 people. I asked every one of them to write a note of encouragement to someone in the church and that I would grade these notes of encouragement on it being short and to the point and not connecting. Well, actually, at that point, I only had two rules. Keep it short and specific. And I, I collected them all and began to read them. And one pastor's wife wrote a note of encouragement to the organist in the church. And her note went like this. Thank you for the beautiful prelude that you played last week before church. It was so much better than the one you played the week before. <laughs> now, is a note like that encouraging or discouraging? What do you think of when you read that note? How good my prelude was this week or how bad it was the week before? Yeah, that's why. So at that point, I added the third rule. Never connect encouragement with past misbehavior. You don't say something about how terrible their behavior was. Thanks for going to bed without fussing last night. It was so much better than the night before when you fussed for a half an hour and I could hardly stand it. That's not a note of encouragement. And you will watch your children or the people that you write encouragement to, you watch them change in front of your eyes as they read that. I have to tell you, one time when I was uh, teaching elementary school, I had the first three years of school all in one classroom, about 15 kids early on in my teaching career. And uh, at the end of the very first week of school, I decided I would write a note of encouragement to all 15 students. And I sat in their little desks at Friday afternoon after the kids had gone home, and I began to write a note of encouragement, short and to the point, and I just taped it inside their desk, the kind of desk that you, you lift up the lid and there's the place where you put uh, the books and their pencils and things. And I got to one desk right in the middle, and it was a boy named Robert. And I tried to think of all week long, what could I thank him for? What could I encourage him for? And I couldn't think of a single thing that he had done good. He was a terrible kid, misbehaved all week long. Boy, I was going to have a hard time. I went to the other desk and I wrote notes of encouragement to all of them. I came back and I, I had to do something. And I looked at his desk and I saw something on the the chair, there was a crack all the way through the chair. 
And I remember that he had told me that whenever he wiggled, which he did all week long, the little crack on the chair pinched his little bottom. And he was always wiggling and going, ow, ow, ow. And I said, well, at least I can give him a new desk. So I went out to the shed where they kept the new desk. I got a new one and brought it in. And I was transferring the books from the old desk with a crack in this chair to the new one. And when I lifted up the lid, Robert's books were stacked one on top of the other. So I put them in the new desk and it gave me an idea. And I sat down and I wrote a note to him. Thank you for keeping your desk so neat. You're a great example to all of us. Monday morning when the kids came in and they began to discover their notes, Robert sat there just with his arm folded. He knew he wasn't going to get a note of encouragement. He saw the other kids get him, and he knew one wasn't coming his way. And finally he opened his desk, and there was the note. And he literally stuck his head in the, in the desk, and he read this little note. And then he put it down, and he put the lid down. He never said a word about it. And he never talked to me about it. But almost a month later, Robert's mother came up to me at church on Sabbath, and she said to me, I don't know what you've said to Robert at school, but for the last month, his room has been neat. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That one little note about a half a dozen books piled on top of each other transferred into his keeping his bedroom neat because now he began to see himself as someone who was a neat person. Well, lots of things that we could talk about family dynamics, but just in a couple minutes, let me point out some lessons about salvation in 1 Samuel 17. We're talking about the battle of the Valley of Elah. You know, in the early part of the chapter, for Samuel 17, about Goliath's challenge, what he's going to do. He comes every day. You can go to this riverbed in Israel today. It's the same place. The riverbed is still full of stones, and on this side is the hill where the Philistine army was camped. Over here on this side of the bank is the place where Saul's army camped. We're told that... Um, that Saul's army was made up of mighty, brave men, 1 Samuel 14, 52. But they came out every morning and every evening facing each other across the riverbed. And the Philistines would yell across the riverbed at, the, at Saul's army, and the Israelites would yell across the army at the Philistine army. Every morning and every evening, that's the way the battle of the Valley of Elah was fought. For 40 days. And after the shouting and the insults and the swearing across the riverbed took place, Goliath, this great giant of a man, would walk into the riverbed closer to Saul's army and he would shake his fist and he would defy the king of Israel and he would defy the army of the king of Israel and he would defy the God of Israel and he would shout and swear and, and insult and that's the way the battle was raised. Over here on the, this side was Saul's army. Not one single of the mighty, valiant men ever drew the sword out of its scabbard. Not one of them put a bow, uh, an arrow in their bow and shot it across the river. They stood there and yelled at each other. Kind of reminds you a lot of the fighting we hear, doesn't it? I hear it in homes. I hear it between husbands and wives. I hear it between parents and children. Stopped at a grocery store the other day and a mother was stopping on the outside of the grocery store where the lotto tickets were sold. And the little child in the basket was trying to get mother's attention. And just as I walked by, I heard the mother say, oh, just shut up. Oh, it's amazing we talk about each other. We just fight each other like Israelites and Philistines, don't we? That's the way the battle was going on. Saul's army was paralyzed. And it didn't matter that Saul had offered these mighty inducements to the soldiers. If anybody went out there and fought Goliath and won the battle, Saul was going to give him great wealth. Secondly, he was going to give one of his daughters to the soldier in marriage, 
We don't know which daughter it was. We presume it was an inducement. Don't know what the daughter was like. But maybe Saul was trying to get rid of her and all the soldiers knew that. I don't know. But you'd think that marrying into the king's family would be a wonderful thing. And then thirdly, he would exempt, the king would exempt the soldier's family from taxes for the rest of his life. I don't know about you, but in America, that would have meant people would down there fighting all the time. Would have been a great thing to do. But they were paralyzed. They stood on the opposite bank shouting. And it's just at that moment when David arrives with the food from Bethlehem. He comes, he leaves the provisions with a supply sergeant, he goes down to the riverbank, and the first thing he hears is Goliath shouting at Saul's army and defying the king and blaspheming the God of Israel. And immediately David begins to ask, who's going to go down there and fight this man who's doing this? Why aren't you all jumping at the chance? Isn't Saul going to give something to the people that are going to do it? Why aren't you fighting? And you remember the oldest brother the response that he gives, they begin to quarrel instead of encourage each other. And the other, David says, can I even talk? And then he turns and he talks to somebody else, asks the same question, why aren't you going down there and fighting? And they give him the same kind of answer. And the quarreling begins. I just was thinking and reading the story the last couple days about the consistent result that happens when we tell other people that they should be fighting particular battles instead of going down ourselves and fighting our battles. It's always the same, isn't it? And yet how many of us are tempted to talk to other people about their battles and what they should fight? Of course it's a great thing to encourage people when they're fighting and they've invited you into the, having the encouragement. But many of us think that our role in life, especially in the Christian life, is to tell other people what battles they ought to be fighting. And the result is always the same. And then we've got the episode in this chapter about trying to fight in Saul's armor and all the implications that it has for us. David did his best to walk out of Saul's tent with Saul's armor on. It was probably the best armor in the camp of Israel, but it didn't work for David because they were different sizes. And my friends, it's exactly the same for us. We all must fight our battles in our own armor. We can't do it in each other's armor because you have conquered a temptation in a particular way does not mean that your neighbor can conquer the temptation the same way that you conquered it. Perhaps one day in your life you were a heavy smoker and God moved in your life in strange and mysterious ways and one day you woke up and you no longer had a desire to smoke. That does not mean that every smoker is going to have the overcoming experience exactly the same way. Some people struggle with temptations like that, addictions like that, for years and years and years. We don't know. Your makeup and their makeup are probably different. Some of us are addictive personalities. Some of us aren't. There may be other things in their life that we don't know anything about that's predisposing them. We can't fight the battle in each other's army, armor. We have to fight in the armor that God gives us. And in David's case, it was an amazing thing that God gave him. He got off of the army of the king. He took it off. He went down into the riverbank. And, and we begin to see the focal point of this story as David reaches down and he picks up five little stones and he approaches the giant Goliath with just these five stones and a slingshot. It is significant that over and over again we are told that David is just a boy. At the beginning of the chapter with the little boy out in the, in the watching the sheep, when Saul is talking to David, and David says, I can't go on this. Saul calls him just a child, just a boy. And then we see Goliath, who looks down at David and sees that he's only a boy. Ruddy and handsome, but just a boy. And Goliath despised him. Verse 43, he said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David by his gods. Come here, Goliath said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. It is significant that we know that he is just a boy 
facing this man that the king of Israel has said has been a fighting man since the time he was a child. Look at the size of his armor. Look at the, the length of his spear and the length of his javelin. It's all there to show the contrast between Goliath and how David approaches this particular battle. We must always remember that the Bible asks us to present at this battle the evidence of what we have to win the battle. In David's hand were five rocks. And he holds the rocks up for everyone in the world to see, for you and me in this tent this morning to see. He faces the entire army of the Philistines and the giant of their champion that was standing in front of them. And he holds up his hands and in effect he says, this is all we have to defeat the Philistine army, a small handful of rocks. In other words, we do not have the might that it takes to do this. Over and over again, it's the same story. Gideon and his 300 holding up torches and blowing trumpets is not a story about what God can do with 300 people. It's the impossibility of 300 men fighting the battle that was set before Gideon with simply torches and trumpets. You can't do it. Uh, Jonathan and the armor bearer crawling up the escarpment to fight the Philistines is not a story about what God can do with mighty Jonathan and his armor bearer. It is of the impossibility of fighting such a battle. Jehoshaphat takes his choir out to meet the enemy. It's not a story of what God can do with a good choir. It is the story that we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Look it up in 2 Chronicles verse, chapter 20. We have no might against this great company that comes against us. We don't even know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's Jehoshaphat's message. It's Gideon's message. It's David's message in the riverbank. All we've got is these stones. And David knew it just as well as he knew that it was the Lord that delivered, the, delivered him from the bear and the lion. Look what he says. Verse 45, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Verse um, 46. Today the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, and all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. You see what the message is? The hero of the story is God. And the salvation implication is exactly the same. This is the way that God fights the salvation battle. Not with sword and spear, not with anything we can do. All we have in our hands is five little stones. We don't win heaven with five rocks. But everybody will know today when this battle is over that that's not the way God saves. He is the one that delivers our enemy. And so the battle is engaged and just like that it's over. It takes no time at all. There is Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, lying dead in front of the Philistine army and in front of the army of Saul. And David stands over the conquered foe, having just repeated those marvelous words. Everyone here will know that it's God who delivers. And he turns around because there's a rumbling on the bank where all of Saul's army is standing. As people suddenly draw their swords and they place the arrows in their bows and they begin to shout not insults across the army, across the river to the Philistine army, they begin to shout, we've won! We've won! We've won! Now, if I had been David, I would have turned around, <coughs> looked at the army of Saul, put my hands on my hips, and said, what do you mean you've won? What have you been doing for 40 days? 
I'm the one who's down here facing the giant. I won. What do you mean you've won? But that's not what happened because I believe David knew the importance of what he was doing. And I believe with all my heart that David is, is a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do in the dry riverbed of this earth, wading into battle against the champion that comes against us. While you and I have stood here getting defeated day after day after day, trying to manage to shout about the enemy, but not engaging in warfare and not winning many battles. And suddenly the enemy is dead, lying in the riverbed. Jesus standing over the conquered foe. And you and I standing on the riverbed, beginning to swell the shout, we've won, we've won, we've won. And Jesus looks at us and says, exactly the point. I came here to beat the enemy, to defeat him, so that you might have the victory. And then an interesting postscript to the story in 1 Samuel 17. The Bible says that Saul's army crossed the riverbank and pursued the Philistines all the way back to the border of their country. It is to the people who have been given the victory that we can expect that they will pursue the enemy. And how many times we get it backwards. How many times we say to our children, go out today and fight the enemy. Pursue the enemy all the way back to their, to their country. Go ahead and fight the battles all the way back. Day after day, fight the battle. And we don't give them the victory to begin with. The Bible's way is to give us the victory and then pursue the enemy. See the difference? Try to pursue the enemy without the victory and you'll be defeated. Try to pursue the enemy and win the battles without being given the victory and you'll be overcome over and over again. But accept the victory from the hand of our champion and then we pursue the enemy every time and win the battle. May it be our experience today to pursue the enemy because we've accepted the victory from the hand of our champion. May it be our experience today to hold up the rocks of our own life and say, this is all I have. It will not win the victory by itself. All we have in our hand, just rocks. But Jesus has done the fighting for us. He's won the victory. He delivers the enemy and gives us the victory. Father, thank you for that victory this morning. Thank you that we are your children. We have learn the lesson through the stories that you've left for us that we only are victorious when you have won the battle and given us the victory. What a, what a wonderful armor we have been given. What a wonderful victory. And we go through the rest of this day and this place thankful that we can shout the victory has been won because you've given it to us. We praise you now for that in Jesus' name. Amen.